My name is Glenda Cox I'm from South Africa, and I'm going to chair the session today. Uh, I think we're going to get started. I'm not sure if there was a delay after the plenary, but I think in the interests of time, we should get going. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, fellow Goji Enno, uh, Caroline Kuhn, to have, do the first presentation. The way it'll work is, um, after 15 minutes, I'm going to indicate to the speaker five more minutes. We have four sessions. There is a little bit of time at the end, so if there isn't time for questions after the immediate session, we'll take some questions at the end. So, and I'm going to be very strict about time so we can get everything in, <laughs> even though we've got a double show at the end, though. Okay, <laughs> okay, o over to you, Caroline. So, thank you. Um, I'm presenting with Michelle Harrison and Irwin, who is in the screen in Canada at two o'clock in the morning, joining us uh, with a blue sky, yes. Um, so yeah, um, our presentation, um, we're, we're really complementing each other very well, and I think it has been a wonderful alignment. So what we're presenting here is, as the title indicates, a cartography of an OER towards a more permeable and organic OER system. And what we're trying to do is how that system, how can we make that system organic? And what does that mean um, when we think about OERs? And this is us, and the presentation is in the slide, um, in the OER Connect site. So if you are interested, there it is. And if you're interested in the presentation, there is a short um, URL as well. And um, heading this slide over to my colleague, Irwin. Well, hi, everybody, and I'm glad I can be here, and I hope uh, you're enjoying the weather there and having some, some good times getting back together again. It's been far too long where we've been able to kind of do this kind of thing. So I wasn't able to come over, but hopefully soon I'll be able to join three-dimensional human conferences again. So anyway, so if we look at this slide, here we see uh, some depictions of the mythical ship of Theseus. And uh, it was discussed in an old ancient Greek paradox by philosophers. And it's still used in philosophy classes and debates kind of as an interesting thought experiment. <clears throat> and the question is, if over time the planks on the ship rot away and you replace them one by one till at some point you've replaced the whole ship, is it still the same ship? Is it still Theseus or is it something else? And there's many variations to this puzzle in different histories and different cultures as well, too. So it's an easy problem to get tangled up in, and I'm sure you can see how easy it is to get on a long tangent uh, with philosophical debate about it. But we wonder, can that metaphor help us with OER? And that's kind of what we're getting at here. Do we get trapped in thinking of an OER as a static object, as something in a repository of some kind, with its renewal as something outside of its original identity and meaning, largely to be forgotten, or do we want to think of it as inherently calling for its change over time? And if so, what are these processes? Who keeps them alive? What are their purpose? How can they be embedded, most importantly, in our actual teaching and learning practice? So we're investigating the idea that the meaning of an OER extends beyond its early existence as an object such as an open textbook or media piece. And we want to embrace the processes of change as fundamental to the purpose and identity of OER. These are not new questions. I know they've been well debated uh, in, in uh, the literature and in communities over time. But our intention here is to explore and promote these changes in concrete ways and integrate them into examples of pedagogical activities uh, within the setting of open educational practices. So as you could probably gather, we're kind of thinking beyond the five R's of OER, the reuse, revise, remix, redistribute, retain cycle. And we're thinking about the ongoing process of regeneration. Uh, which is another R. And there are many R's when you start digging into it, but that's another whole story. I'll stop here for now and hand the slide back. So, yes, as um, Irwin said, we are really wondering, well, why are we here? And I think we're wondering really how can we um, change or continue the evolution and the growth of theory and praxis about OERs and about OEPs as well. So how do they integrate together and how can they be more fluid? Um, and how can we contribute to change in our tools and practices within these open educational practices? And how and what does that mean? 
Um, and how do the concept of sustainability and ecosystem, and I think those two things really are interesting, and how do they fit in our understanding, and avoiding this um, open determinism, which Sarah Lambert uh, wrote a wonderful paper which is linked in um, a resource list that we have linked in this presentation, and is this open by itself doesn't do anything. It really needs scaffolding, it needs um, being with those people who use the OER, how do you do it, why do you do it, how do you change it, so it's really the scaffolding process that goes with it. And so what are we doing? Um, so we are exploring really how can we change, how can we make sustainable the life cycle of an OER and what does that mean? <coughs> um, and so it's about the regenerative process of it, more than just sustainability, what does regeneration mean and how can we make that happen in the, you know, really in the, in the, in real life, I would say. Um, and with that, I give you, yeah. yeah. And, um, we will be talking about two sort of examples, um, and we have this, this linkage between our two projects. We'll come back to that later. Um, okay, Erwin, we're back to you. Right. <clears throat> and so as, as, as we're leading up to or approaching OER, at least in part as something that involves ongoing change over time, what are the systems around it? What's inherent to it? Um, how do we look at OER in a way that change and its continuing evolution is part of what it's all about? And what it means is that rather than get too hot and bothered about the ship of Theseus uh, paradox, that we, we embrace it. We, we see that as part of the bigger picture and the story. Um, and in the work that we've been doing, we're looking at OER in a way that iterates, that each one becomes an artifact in itself and in terms of iterations and can either feel new challenges or affirmations or they can stagnate and just reproduce old knowledge as well too. And so they need ongoing regeneration uh, as a node in a larger learning matrix. We're not trying to solve a metaphysical problem. Uh, it's probably unsolvable unless somebody comes with a really clever trick, but it's been there for over you know, two, two millennia, so who knows. But getting to the meaning of OER as more of a process than a thing, and that's, how, that's the frame that we use to approach the, uh, some of the work that we've been involved in. And so their meaning becomes part of their use in teaching and learning. And that's the challenge that uh, we've put in front of ourselves and we're trying to work with. Back to you. So earlier we talked a little bit about framing OER as part of a, um, in the terms of ecosystems and sustainability. And so generally from a biological perspective, we think of ecosystems as um, complex uh, interactions between organisms and their environments. So if we think about the OER ecosystem, I think we're thinking at different scales, we're thinking about connections, we're thinking about networks. Um, and so we're, you know, extending that metaphor to the terrarium, we're helping it will become sort of a self-sustaining environment for the most part. But there still has to be some, some inputs in that as well. So it's not just going to continually um, grow and regenerate without that. So from an ecosystem perspective, we're hoping to think about OERs from different scales, like global to local, and what that means from policies, institutions, and technologies more at that large level to um, being able to think about the way that can, smaller communities can kind of take that OER on. We think a lot about sustainability, and we've had lots of conversations over the last few days about what happens when your funding runs out, for example. How do you sustain that OER? And so if we think about um, you know, the, a community sort of taking on and growing and changing, and that, as Erwin said earlier, the artifact um, becomes something new. How can we introduce ideas, um, not only of sustainability, but beyond that to regeneration? And so in our couple of projects, we've been talking about that quite a bit. Erwin, do you wanna add anything? I think you've covered it. Okay, good. Okay, so here's the project that um, Erwin and I and Michael Pascovicius and Tannis Morgan have been working on um, for quite some time. And um, it, it sort of evolved out of this idea that um, we're, we're all sort of focused on learning design and developing open educational practices and that 
we really need to sort of rethink learning design in that context. And so as we thought about, at the, right now there's not a lot of um, literature or things that you might use with students that takes a critical approach to learning design, and, and a few resources have emerged really recently. But as we th thought, well, we need this resource, it's like, well, we also want to model what opening up an OER could be, like, how do you actually build that in? So our project has two components, and we've been thinking about the resource itself, and how do you actually create uh, a learning, a rethink learning design resource that invites um, more critical practice, including um, more student voice, marginalized voices, um, in, in, a, in a meaningful way. So we've been talking about that quite a bit. Um, and then to also, we want it to be iterative and responsive. So using a, a framework to reposition. So as we've developed the reader, we've actually developed a platform that we've been testing with students that embeds the student voices directly in. Um, to the resource itself. We were, taught, we were calling it an untextbook. We sort of moved away from that. Um, and so what we really want students to bring is to help build them new, new perspectives. And so when we did our call for proposals for contributions, we really framed it around using provocations as a jumping off point for um, a, whoever's going to be using the book to have students reframe, reposition um, and add their own voices to the resource. So Erwin will give you a couple of examples. Right, so, um, so basically the idea of it being an, in, on textbook is that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's built in WordPress and uh, whatever, it can be used in many different contexts with different types of con uh, content in it. Um, both Michelle and I have been field testing it in our courses. They're both graduate courses at Royal Rose University in uh, teaching and learning with technology. And so, uh, and the idea is that we start off with initial provocations. It could be blog posts, um, articles, scholarly publications, um, whatever we have. And then the students work with that and they, we call it reflect, respond, and reframe. So they write new chapters. They take it and they continue the work onwards and forwards, uh, but they take specific perspectives that actually help enrich and improve uh, that original document, uh, if you can call it a document, in new ways. And it also is open to different media rather than just print itself. So they can do podcasts or videos or anything like that. And uh, what you see here is uh, an actual uh, screenshot from the tool itself where after, just behind the, the blog post in this particular case where the students read, they then create their own uh, contribution by reframing that existing content uh, from the context of various issues. You can see the list here, I can't read them all. Different role perspectives because those affect the way we review content, uh, or review it, uh, different kinds of lenses as well and from different kinds of settings. And so they take one or more of those and they try to apply those um, in, in a, with a sense of empathy and solidarity towards the issues and the lenses that they're writing for and the communities they're writing about uh, and creating new content. And that falls back in to the text itself. So the text keeps evolving and growing and regenerating in concert with the students. So I applied to this project with a project that ended um, already almost a year ago and I presented in the online conference together with four researchers that we worked on this data praxis project. It's about fostering critical data literacy for educators. And so the question is, the resource is there, um, which is, so this is a screenshot of the site itself. And if you jump, so if you go to that link, you will see that we have five modules, we have some interactive tools for teachers to use. So there, this is an OER in itself with many sub-OERs in it. And so the question was, well, the project finished, great. We piloted it in Kenya, in Tangasa University. We piloted it in Spain, in the Open University of Catalonia, in Uruguay with Virginia Rodés and the Nucleorea and in the University of Surrey. 
And great, it worked, it was superb, but what do we do now? And what do I do with this? And it's a pity to just leave it there to die. So what I, within this project, then I kind of thought, well, for example, each of these modules have a glossary of terms. So is the meaning, for example, of data agency the same thing in an indigenous community in New Zealand or in a rural community in Kenya or even in South Africa or in Namibia? or in Colombia. So what is the meaning of data agency for those communities? Can they write this resource, which is again embedded in the bigger module, in their own terms? And what would be the learning that they get from it? Another thing we have is a podcast series. So we interviewed experts in data and different aspects of open data. But are those the experts that maybe are meaningful for, again, people in Kenya or people in yeah, or people in Namibia or people in Colombia, well, not necessarily. So they can take this idea of having a podcast series, but interviewing the people that for them is meaningful and with the concepts that for them are meaningful to discuss instead of taking what is there, which in a way is inert for them. It's not meaningful, so how can that be meaningful for them? Then we have activities and challenges. But I guess that if we're analysing a social reality and looking at Data, the politics of data within that reality, that reality looks different. Again, if you look at from data feminism, it's different. If you look at from an ethnic minority, it's different. If you look at it from so many different lenses that were in the slide that we just showed before, well, then how those activities are framed, and they will be different. And I think, and we were discussing this quite, so the recommended reading list. What's a reading list that is meaningful for situations that needs to be addressed in Venezuela, New Zealand, Australia. Within Australia, again, in your little localities. And so what we were thinking here is that this resource, which is a WordPress site um, that has then many different tools that you can use in your classroom, it can be really regenerated and be recreated in a way that makes sense for those who use that resource. And I think there are more things to say, but although we have, I think, maybe four or three minutes I would love to leave the three minutes to see if someone has any input, any idea, any suggestion. And I think with this, if I'm not wrong, yeah, I'll finish. So how, how does that resonate with you? And have you had any situation where you think, oh, I don't want this OER to die, and how can I keep it alive? And thank you very much, I think, for the attention. Yeah, if anything pops in your <laughs> Yes. Yeah. How about combining your WordPress core material with a wiki like technology in the end to make those different lenses possible for the audience who consumes the material? So you can have that renditive process in there. <laughs> yeah, wiki is a brilliant tool. So this is also a multi site. So you can create multi, each one can create a site for their own open educational resource, which I think is quite handy because it gives you also this literacy. Can I create my yeah. own site? But the wiki is more, I would say, more open, yes, and more. The ethos is more open, so, yeah. Although WordPress is open code, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, it's again open. It's a good suggestion, thank you. Yes. So thank you. Um, I really loved your presentation and, and sustainability is really close to my heart and there are all sorts of definitions. Um, now you're talking about keeping something really valuable alive um, and I, I love the, the idea of building on that. Um, um, another aspect of that is if you want to make those connections of those other living uh, objects uh, and connect them and create a collection and curate that, who is going to fund you? Or who is going to make sure that that system uh, which you will grow, and I really hope this grows, right? Um, uh, who's going to take the responsibility of that? Are you going to be there, or is it somebody else? Um, and, and how can we make all of what we are doing, so if we build this kind of infrastructure and these collections. I think it's really important that we think about when we um, 
put seed funding into things and develop things, how are we going to sustain, how are we as a community going to help sustain financially also, right? So the work, uh, the systems, because they need maintaining. I'm not sure whether you've thought about that. I know it's probably a way off from now, um, but, you know, we talked about brilliant. So can you we, can come in? We did talk a, a bit about this. So for one of the things we've been thinking about is, um, so the platform itself will be shared in, a, uh, it's called Open ETC, and it's a community-supported um, platform. It's for specifically British Columbian, British Columbia. So it's there to support smaller institutions who may not have the kinds of supports. So there are already some collectives started that can help support this work. Um, as we know, it is our, you know, our salaries, if we're lucky enough to have those positions, are, are funded. And so I think it's part of, as, as you're teaching with the materials, you're, you sort of take it on, uh, you and your students would help, would be one way. Um, and then we're hoping, you know, once you take that artifact as an instructor, that, you know, you're helping to grow it with your own network. So I still think it, it takes care and it takes time and it's not always going to be funded. Erwin, um, do you want to add anything? Yeah, just just extend the idea of students working on it too because as part of their work rather than, you know, the idea of non-disposable assignments where they're not just throwing their work away but they're actually making contributions to this as part of their uh, coursework and learning. So, I mean, in, in both uh, Michelle and my situation, you know, we have students actually writing and contributing to this and then it's up to the instructor as to how much of it you want to bring forward and the tool allows you to um, select the pieces that you think might be helpful the next time around in a different course and also because it's being hosted as Michelle said in a um, in a province-wide and it can be any kind of jurisdiction that we're talking about here where we're looking at cross-institutional platform support rather than giving it all over to private industry uh, <clears throat> or institutions do this as, as, a, as a cooperative um, then it's available freely, it's open source tools, people can continue to evolve it with the expertise that they have in tools such as WordPress, but also, um, importantly, it's not just about tools, it's about practice and about the vision of what it's all about. And I think that that comes through, you know, uh, teacher, uh, faculty, learning and, and development and growth in how to use open educational practices and tools. So it's yeah, all we, part of the bigger picture. I'm, I'm afraid we have to end the session and I'm sorry I know you can't see us so I'm really sorry to have interrupted you uh, okay. but we need to close and thank you for this and we will have maybe a little bit time at the end if you stick with us or you can go to sleep if that is what you rather do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.